I'm going to be harping on um, is something that I think makes a lot of these companies that are considered heroes, Apple, Google, um, loved in one way or another. And it's something that I think we do only incrementally or only individually. We don't have a sort of global feeling about this being important. And that is a little thing called the user experience. Whatever we create, even if it's the most effective learning programs in the world when used properly, it won't last long if everybody can't use it properly and if they don't enjoy using it. There are a lot of ways to describe what the user experience means. The user interface has a part in it, the device has a part in it, usability has a part in it. Uh, but we are now in the third decade of the internet and so tastes have changed and requirements have changed and the rules have changed. To me, who have been here through the first and second internet decades, um, I think user experience require, is required to accomplish three things. First of all, it has to be emotionally appealing. It has to be either beautifully designed or just plain beautiful. Uh, it has to be very functional. It has to be intuitive. It has to be easy to understand and use, um, which really generally means it has to be very, very simple. And it has to be effective. It has to work. It has to do, be fit for purpose, do what it's designed to do. User experience isn't just technology, though. It goes far beyond technology. It's that uh, friendly voice on the other end of the phone when somebody calls to ask a question. Or it is the product support guys who fix that problem that nobody can fix in a college someplace. Or it's the long-term personal relationships with customers that you all excel in and know by heart and make very, very personal. Um, whatever the experience from Pearson, it should feel genuine. It should feel real, not as if we've concocted it or contrived it, but that we really mean it, because we do really mean it. Um, it has to be a personal experience that is as meaningful to the customer as it is going to be to us. Um, I recently read an interview with, um, in the Toronto Globe and Mail, which another newspaper that still exists. Um, it was with somebody named Bill Buxton. He's the principal researcher with Microsoft. He lives in Toronto. He commutes a week a month to Redmond, Washington. So I guess that's a pretty nice deal. But his specialty is interfaces. He was part of the team that in invented the multi-touch and user interface back in 1994. He's a musician and a composer. He's a designer of digital musical instruments. And he's an award-winning equestrian, my favorite part of this CV. Um, in this interview, he said two important things. He maybe said a lot of other important things that I didn't catch, but these two stood out. He said, it's no longer sufficient just to make a product that works. We're now in an accelerated transition, accelerated transition time in the quality of the user experience. So a product not only has to work, it also has to feel good and not wear you down, which is a pretty good way to put it. And when he was asked how to achieve that, he said this, I don't understand how anybody can make products that offer a great experience if they have limited experience in their own personal life. He said, I try to milk everything I do in my life, almost as if it's a mission to collect experiences. Whether I'm looking at a canoe, a bicycle, or anything else, I always ask myself, why do I love this? What makes it feel so good? What insights can I learn from it that I can, that I can apply to some project I'm working on? How can this affect what I do? He cites, by the way, an unlikely champion for his theory. Um, he says, Jimi Hendrix was right when he said, are you experienced? Of course, Jimi was talking about recreational drugs, but I, I think it's probably a pretty good parallel. Um, for Bill Buxton, are you experienced is the fundamental question that leads to experiences for your customers that work. I don't know of a better way to encourage you to go out and make adventures and try new things than that. Um, we've done okay, I think, in the first couple of decades of the digital age. I think that we've even helped some students and teachers maybe
come into this digital age ourselves. But in this third internet decade, our customers are different. Our users are different. They will be largely digital natives. Um, they will be much more demanding customers looking for different things than the last two generations looked for. These are the people who are going to decide instantly which digital services are a joy to use and which are a drudgery. Um, and unlike the first generation of digital customers who stuck to Microsoft Office if they got used to it, these guys are happy to change horses no matter what, if something entices them or if it fails to entice them. Um, the user experience was summed up pretty well for these digital natives by um, Chris Anderson, who's a pretty well-known guy in Silicon Valley, the editor of Wired Magazine. He said, the web's now 18 years old. It's reached adulthood. An entire generation has grown up in front of a browser. The exploration of a new world has turned into business as usual for us. We get the web. It's part of our life. Now we just want to use the services that make our lives better. This isn't a new concept. It's pretty much as old as the hills to make products and services that help people's lives get better. Um, I'm sure I've talked to you before about the only rule that I've ever figured out made any difference in life. And that is, if you're confused about a decision, err on the side of being generous rather than the side of being stingy. Do the generous, do the magnanimous thing. Um, I think that the same philosophy is a pretty good proxy for a customer service, customer experience idea. Um, it is a crucial ingredient in making our customers happy. Err on the side of generosity. Um, I was moved to think about this the other day when I was reading a newspaper, and I saw that 2011 was the 100th anniversary of two companies that we all know. One was IBM, which was um, founded in 1911 as the computing tabulating recording company. And it made punch cards, and it went on to glory. The other company um, is a company called Whirlpool. You know, the washing machine guys. Um, Whirlpool is more interesting for uh, a couple of reasons. First of all, for centuries, people washed clothes by the river, by a well, by a pot, um, by pounding the dirt out of them and then wringing them out by hand, and that was totally no fun at all. And then those washboards came along, and you could kind of rub the clothes up and down, and that did away with the pounding, but the hand wringing continued. And you can figure out what gender did the hand wringing. I uh, don't have to think very much about that. Um, that changed in 1911 when the Upton Machine Company of St. Joseph, Michigan, later known as Whirlpool, came out with the first motor driven wringer washers. A big day for laundry history. And if you care anything about laundry, which I hope all of you do. <laughs>